Hello, everybody. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. Before we get into the episode today, I did want to take a moment to give a viewer shout out to one of our viewers here, one of our friends here on Esoteric Atlanta named Tracy Woodman. Now, like Adam, whose book link is down in the description box below, Tracy is also an author. And um, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of information about Tracy because she has written some pretty interesting books about mind crimes, which seems to be pretty much the gist of this great awakening, right? So Tracy said, when I was a little girl, I would sit on my bed and write stories. I don't know what happened to them. Sometimes I wish I'd saved them, if only to have a good laugh. I'm sure they weren't very good. I mean, I must have been maybe 11 at the time, but I remember I wanted to grow up to be a writer. And to be honest with you, Tracy, that's what I wanted to be when I was a little girl too. When I was in the fifth grade, I wrote a book called The Golden Glow Cookie Jar. My mom still might have that book somewhere. We had to write it. I think it was in the fifth grade. It was for some competition and I actually won the award for the best story. I wrote a story about a cookie jar that a little girl finds in a new home. And this cookie jar glows this golden color. Every time it glows, she would open the cookie jar and there would be an item in the cookie jar that if she picked it up would transport her back to historical moments in time. So even in the fifth grade, I was a little bit of a history nerd. But Tracy, I totally feel you. I was the same girl. What started out as a challenge to write a book so I could say I wrote a book became a hobby and is now the fulfillment of a childhood dream. In the past few years, I have written three books, two of which are part of what is called Operation Mind Crimes series. I'm working on book three now. Some may call this series historical fiction because it deals with our recent history. The stage is set by revisiting the politics of the 1960s. Many may think that I, what I write is conspiracy theory. That's okay. Although I can tell you that most of what I've written is verifiable. The spirit series exposes some of the secret government programs, such as the story is told from the viewpoint of a young family who was first affected by the Vietnam struggle, then by the realization that the government is using college students, women, and children as experiments to find ways to manipulate the mind. Mind control, brainwashing, manipulation, manipulating the mind, call it what you will. The lives of the Stewart family are permanently altered due to these programs. The stories which expose these truths is told from the perspective of the Stewart family. Although the family is fictitious, much of which they experience has happened in real life. By reading the series, you will be sharing their experiences and emotions of living through these times. I know many who were in the military during the Vietnam struggle. Many hesitate to read the series because they don't want to relive the pain. I understand completely. I want to let you know that the books mostly tell the story of what went on in the States and as witnessed by civilians. There is a chapter towards the end of the first book, The War Within, that might be painful to read. If you do want to read the book, please note that chapter 45 does take place in the Pacific. It is a short chapter. You might want to skip over it, although there is some important information in the chapter that rounds out the story. I am not a veteran. So no matter what I've done for research, I will never understand what you went through. I try to do justice to all the veterans in the series and will continue to do that as a series evolves. I dedicate the first two books to the military and those who have suffered due to crimes. My heart goes out to all of you. In addition to the Operation Mind Game series, I am writing other books. Remember the Kiss tells the story of a second chance while incorporating the idea of reincarnation within the lives of the characters. I'd like to thank Nora Jones for allowing me to use her song, Come Away With Me, in the book. If you are interested in learning more about my books, you can visit my website at www.authorlywoods.com. On my website, you will find my recent work, and you will find the works that will be coming soon. You can read my blog and find my research page. I share the research page so you can see the resources I use when writing my book. You will find many links where you can navigate your, your way to begin your own research as you continue to awaken while remembering to continue to work on yourself, as Bryce says. I want to thank all of you who support my work. While I write fiction, I will try to be sure I incorporate the element of human emotion into my work. My desire is to bring out the best in humanity, even if the situation is dire. I'm hoping to bring healing through what I write. It may take me a little while to realize what the, that looks like but I will continue to work towards helping all of us to move into the light. 
Thank you so much, Tracy. I will be placing all of Tracy's links down in the description box below. I myself am looking forward to reading your series. And I want to say too, if there's anybody else out there that has some work that they would like for me to advertise on this channel, please email me. This channel isn't just about me. It never has been just about me. This channel is about us. We are all just walking each other home. And so I am so proud to be able to showcase anybody's work, especially any person that's out there working for the betterment of humanity. All right, guys, on to the show. Hello, you guys. Welcome to Mystery Monday. We are running this Mystery Monday a little bit different than I normally do my Mystery Mondays because I wanted to run this in kind of a discussion because this is piggybacking off of the Mystery Monday we did a couple of weeks ago that had to do with Robert the Doll. Now, we are also going to be carrying over that conversation on Aquarius Rising Africa this morning at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time with Stephanie pulling the tarot cards and of course with Shanti and Mornay. So with that being said, that is why this episode is going to be run a little bit differently. With Robert the doll, we know that the doll was used in some nefarious way to contain a consciousness or a spirit. And that led us to a couple of other dolls. Now, one of the dolls I found, the open Okiku doll from Japan, I found that we're going to cover, and the Annabelle doll. This also brings us into um, Lorraine and Ed Warren. And I, sorry if you see my eyes looking to the, sky, the side, guys. Normally I know where to look in the camera. But for some reason, I keep wanting to look over here. Anyway, I don't know. Strange day. But first, let's look at the Akiko doll because this isn't new to me. So I'm just actually going to bring you over to this website right here. Again, normally I run this in like a storytelling type of way, but I wanted to have as more of a discussion because we will be following up on this on Aquarius Rising Africa in a couple of hours over, over at, with Shanti and Mornay um, at 10 o'clock. So the Ikiku, the Japanese haunted doll that puts Chucky to shame. The haunted doll phenomenon isn't just craze reserved for super superstitious yanks that's us and chucky lovers now for everybody who's not an american that calls us a yank um us in the south we're not yanks we call northerners yankees so i'm just gonna put that out there it's not just an american genre yes as a whole we might have the most famous examples out there but that just speaks volumes of our branding and marketing skills not our ability to cross swords with the devil and come out on top robert Annabelle, we're going to cover her, Chucky, the holy trinity of possessed our R's. These icons were bred and branded in the good old USA, but those icons and poster children of, chur of cursed sensation are goofy looking compared to some of the fanfare and examples out there at the world at large past the happy meal induced borders. If you want absolute terror, if you want cringe worthy horror, if you want the sort of fright that makes, that might make the lights of Thor ask for his mother, then your best bet is to hop on a plane and travel to the exotic Orient to be exact Japan. The nation of the rising sun basically goes, hold my beer. Whenever we cocky Americans think he has just, he has the market cornered and everything related to the supernatural. Look, we have Jason Voorhees, big deal. That's just a TV and an old VHS. Press play, sure, why not? We might have Chucky, we might have Robert, but Japan has more creepy crawlers of their nature and kind than any Hollywood pitch meeting post-Annabelle box office tri triumph. Japan has Okiku, the haunted doll, and she's just the tip of the very dark iceberg. In Japan, yeah, Japan, you guys are the best when it comes to creepy stuff. So, in 1918, a young man purchased the doll that would later 
on claimed the name of Okiku as her own for his two-year-old sister. And the legend would kickstart a Taurus flash. Japan during this era was still stuck in the ways of feudalism. While the world around her was embracing the process of technology and science, Japan was holding tight to her beliefs and to her rich mythology and fables. This was a land and still is by all accounts where demons, ghosts, vampires, and other creatures roamed free. A land where goblins and evil spirits were constantly harassing normal folks. On February 3rd, you drove evil spirits away by going to shrines and through rituals and folklore practices. S Setsubun events, like monsters, like monsters gobbled kids up. Woods like Okigara, northwest of Mount Fuji, drove people insane and compelled them to remove themselves from the earth. Foxes were sacred and devoted animals. And we're going to actually at some point talk about this forest because this forest creeps me the fuck out. I've known about this stuff. Some stuff I've known about for a long time and I just have shied away because it really freaks me out. Japanese culture was still was and still fraught with lad legends and supernatural boogeymen and dolls, some of the more powerful instruments of magic. You don't mess with the dolls. The doll was bought in Sapporo by a 17 year old Ikichi Suzuki in 1918 for his two-year-old sister, Okiku. He was touring the region of a maritime ex exhibition and the doll instantly drew his eyes. The perfect little thing sat on a shop window enticing him. Suzuki didn't think twice. He went in and instantly purchased the figurine for his sister, used the last of his money for it. About, at about 40 centimeters tall and dressed in traditional kimono, the doll was exquisite. His hair was raven black and cut to roughly shoulder length in tradition of Okapa hairstyle. Her, ears were, her eyes were piece, piercing coals that seemed to swallow everything up in their gaze. The thing was mesmerizing and enchanting, something to take your breath away. Suzuki went ho back home and gave the doll to his little sister. The tyke fell in love with the doll immediately. It transformed into Okiku's favorite to toy and more importantly, her best friend. Okiku played every day with the doll, took it everywhere and treated the figurine like a little sister. She would talk and prattle with the thing, feed it, sleep with it. She decided to call it Okiku, a mere duplication of herself. The doll never left Okiku's sight. Sounds very very much like Robert the doll, right? Like I'll, I'll link that episode down in the description box below if you missed it. But we know that when Jean got Robert, he never left it out of its sight. And Jean named Robert, Robert, because that's Jean's first name. So that sounds very eerily familiar. Then a year later, tragedy stuck. In 1919, Okiku died. Yellow fever had descended on the land and rubbed the little, the fa the, and robbed the family of a little girl. I think they meant to say robbed robbed the family of the little girl. Ukiku died grasping for air in pain and afraid. The doll held firmly in her grasp. She was only three years old. The family wanted to bury the doll along with Ukiku, but circumstances and governmental oversight prevented this last act of kindness on their part. The doll was never laid to rest with Ukiku, the shrine. Ukiku the doll was alternatively located in the family's altar, a common practice in certain Japanese households to commemorate the dead. The small shrine celebrated their daughter and marked her passing into the afterlife. That's when the weirdness started to occur. Dun, dun, dun. One day, the family started to notice the doll's hair was getting longer. Once a traditional shoulder length cut with the neat ends, now a mangled mess of split ends reaching down past her waist. It was scruffy, different colors, and felt different. At night, they started to dream of Okiku, and sometimes the doll would appear by their side come morning. Oh my God, that's so much like Annabelle too, which we're going to cover Annabelle on this episode after we talk about Okiku. Oh, see, you guys seeing like a lot of these stories are carrying the same characteristics. So we're seeing a connection between Robert the doll and Okiku, Okiku. And now we're seeing a connection between Okiku and Annabelle that we're going to talk about later. All right, let's see. Okay, so at night they started to dream of Okiku and sometimes the doll would appear by their side come morning. The chilling events intensified and grew into a full-blown axe of spiritual infestation. That is something, that's a term that the Warrens use as well, spiritual infest, infest, infestation, which we'll talk about with Annabelle. Lights flickering on and off, banging in the houses, noises, strange voices. The closer the year got to certain dates, Okiku's birthday and the day of her death. 
Over time, they were certain the town shaman spiritual leaders concurred that their daughter's soul was in fact trapped within the doll. This is what they thought about Annabelle as well, but the Warrens have a completely different theory on this, which is interesting, which we'll talk about when we talk about Annabelle. In 1938, the family relocated to a different district. They had by now become accustomed to a kiku and had even grown fond of their daughter's wrestle spirit. To them, it was magical and unique opportunity to interact with the dead, not desiring to take Okiko with them, fearing that fearing that would fuel her magic was the proximity to their daughter's grace. The, the grave, the family approached the local temple and asked them to care for the doll. The temple by now had heard countless stories of the amazing doll, the haunted doll whose hair grew every year. They were fascinated. Skipping like schoolgirls with the prospect, the priest gleefully accepted the charge and started taking care of Okiku. Over time, they've managed to confirm the veracity of some of the claims, particularly that the hair does indeed grow. So fucking creepy. Oh, my God. The priests have sent out cut samples of the hair for scientific analysis. Scientific examination of Okiku proves the hair was that of a human child? That's so creepy. Regularly, the hair gets trimmed. The doll stays happy and content. As the years pass on, the doll's fame grew and her powers further develop. She's bolder now, invading the dreams of the priest and those who come to visit her. She's stronger, her hair growing faster and wilder. And she's even spookier. The last event driving tourists mad in this frightening claim is the mouth of Okiko is slowly opening and that if you dare to peer inside it, inside of it, you may be able to glimpse something like a baby teeth sprouting like, like leaves from porcelain gums. That is so freaking creepy. All right. So Okiku is located in a private shrine on display in a little wooden box in uh, Meneji Temple in a town of, I, I, went, I was Azawa, Hoka, Hokido, Japan. I probably said that wrong. I'm sorry. She's there waiting for Hall to play with fire and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the paranormal and the bizarre. All right, so let's look at this temple. Again, you guys, I found this. Um, when we get into Annabelle, we're going to get more back into the storytelling type. But holy shit, I found this story. And I was like, we got to talk about, oh, there she is, guys. There's the freaking Okiku, Okiku doll. All right, and there is so many... So many crossovers between these all these haunted dolls. And again, I'm going to tell you why the Warrens say that no, children are not haunting these dolls. It's very interesting when we talk about Annabelle next. So if you are from Japan or know anything about Okiku, please let me know down in the comment section below. And also make sure to check us out over on Aquarius Rising Africa at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. So check your local listing as far as your time difference from the East Coast. Um, and you can join us interactively in the chat because this shit is so freaky and it's beyond our understanding. And I think that we're going to have to start to understand it because, um, hello, this is The Great Awakening. Ed and Lorraine Warren are two of the most famous people in paranormal history. Ed Warren was born on September the 7th, 1926, and Lorraine Warren was born on the 31st of January, 1927. Ed Warren was a self-taught demonologist, and Lorraine Warren, his wife, was a clairvoyant. In 1952, they founded the New England Society for Psychic Research, and through this society, they ended up researching over 10,000 cases. And their research society was kind of unique in, in the fact that they didn't just use Ed as a demonologist or Lorraine as a clairvoyant. No, they had an array of different specialists on staff for each of these investigations, including medical doctors, police officers, members of the clergy, as well as researchers to try to find the historic significance between haunted locations. Ed and Lorraine Warren were so famous that even if you don't know who they are, you probably know some of the cases that they've worked on, including the Amityville hauntings, which inspired the Amityville horror, as well as other cases that inspired The Conjuring. Ed and Lorraine Warren also ended up having a museum. It was called the Warren's Occult Museum that was basically in the back of their house. 
Now, Ed Warren passed away in 2006, but Lorraine Warren only recently passed away in 2018. Now, from my research, it looks like that her son-in-law and her daughter were running the occult museum, but unfortunately now it is closed. I don't know if that was due to the lockdown or if they were just kind of tired of it. I don't know. But regardless, the Warren's Occult Museum had tons of trinkets and artifacts from all these haunted locations, including an alleged demonically possessed doll named Annabelle. In 1971, a nurse in training named Donna received a Raggedy Ann doll from her mother as a gift. At first, Donna just kind of snuggled with the Raggedy Ann doll and left it in the bedroom. But over time, she kind of decided to bring the doll to the breakfast table with her and her roommate, Angie, who was also a nurse in training. When I read this story, I immediately got the same sensation I got with Robert the doll, where Jean was starting to take Robert to do all these human activities with him, almost like there was kind of a trance over the owner of the doll. Well, Angie and Donna became very intrigued by the doll because as the doll started coming down to the breakfast table, they would see the doll start to move. And allegedly, eventually, they started to find little notes around the house written in a child's handwriting that read, help me. Now, Donna and Angie were both in training at Hartford Hospital, Hartford being the capital of the state of Connecticut, where our friend Stephanie is from. This also happens to be the home of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Well, over time, Donna and Angie ended up going on the same work schedule, which was basically 4 p.m. to 12 a.m. And since they were gone out of the apartment at the same time, they eventually came to notice that this doll was doing a lot of stuff when they were away. Angie, the roommate, told Donna that she had a friend who was a psychic medium. And so they decided to bring the psychic medium into their house to figure out what was going on with this Raggedy Ann doll. Well, the psychic medium informed them that the doll possessed a spirit of a seven-year-old girl by the name of Annabelle Higgins. She even said that at one point there was a car accident right outside of the apartment complex and the soul of the little girl attached itself to the Raggedy Ann doll. Well, at first, Donna and Angie really became very loving towards this doll. I mean, they felt like they had this little girl in their house that they were responsible for, they had to take care of. But over time, things started to get more and more aggressive. At this time, Angie was dating a man named Lou. And Lou kind of started to suspect that maybe this Raggedy Ann doll was not what the girls thought it was or what the psychic medium thought it was. He noticed that there was more of a nefarious side from this Raggedy Ann doll. He expressed his concerns to Angie and his idea was that they should openly burn the doll. Well, that night, Lou said that he had a dream that the Raggedy Ann doll that they were calling Annabelle at this time after the alleged little girl who died. Well, he saw Annabelle strangling him in his dream. He woke up the next morning to tell Donna and Angie about the dream. And lo and behold, he had marks on his throat. Once the marks were noticed on his throat, he turned around and started screaming at the doll. At that time, slashes psychically started to peer across his chest. Well, Donna and Angie realized that there was something obviously more nefarious about this Annabelle Raggedy Ann doll. At this point, the war Warrens were called in to investigate the case. The Warrens were, were quick to tell Donna and Angie that no, this doll did not possess the spirit of a young child. In fact, Ed Warren, as a demonologist, firmly believes that there is no way that God would allow a deceased child to spirit to be stuck in an object. This was a theory I thought was very interesting hearing Ed talk about this. And in fact, I will place in the description box below a YouTube of Ed speaking on this subject. And this was something that I never really considered. Of course, we had this theory too with Robert the doll from a couple of weeks ago. We also have this with the previous story I told on this uh, in this episode of a Kiku about a child's spirit being stuck to a doll or an object. But of course, Ed Warren is saying, no, that's not possible. God would not allow that to happen. He would take the child into the other side. In fact, what Ed Warren believed was that this was a demonic spirit. Ed Warren said that demonic spirits can often mimic children in order 
to make their way into the homes of loving, caring people. Exactly what had happened to this Raggedy Ann doll as Donna and Angie were loving on this doll, assuming it was a seven-year-old little girl. Ed and Lorraine Warren believed that this doll, before even coming into Donna and Angie's house, had been used in an occult ritual. He believed that someone, some unnamed person, had conjured a demon and put the demon into the doll in order to cause harm. Ed Warren even referenced something called ritual magic for murder. Now, I know from my studies of the grimoires missing from the Bible that when you conjure a demon, the demon then becomes a slave to you. As we understand now, when Lucifer fell and all the fallen angels fell with him, what we, what we weren't told in church is that the fallen angels had no choice. They were kidnapped and brought down with Lucifer. And so now when they're used to commit harm, they're done so by being attached to certain black magic practitioners and certain objects. They're chained almost. We know that people who heal demon demonic attachments try to send the demons back into the light, back to God, where they too can be healed. And so that makes sense to me from my study of these grimoires, that if a person is practicing black magic and wants to do harm to someone else, one of the best ways to do that is to attach a demon to an object, a, a seemingly innocent object like a Raggedy Ann doll to, to have it put in someone's home where it can cause a lot of harm and damage. Lorraine and Ed Warren ended up taking the doll from Donna and Angie and had priests come in to bless their home and cleanse out their home. The doll ended up located in the occult museum in their backyard. And so many people had so many crazy experiences with this doll in their museum, the same as Robert the doll. Now, as I said, with Ukiku, there are so many crossovers and similarities between all of these stories, which we will be breaking down and talking about on Aquarius Rising Africa this morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. As always, please join us if you can for the live show, again, Eastern Standard Time, so whatever time that is for you, so you can participate in the live chat. We had so much fun with you guys last week when we spoke about Robert the Doll. It was you guys that suggested we cover the Cabbage Patch Kids, which will be coming up in the next couple of weeks, where we're going to actually do a live investigation into the Cabbage Patch Kid factory that is here in North Georgia. So I would really appreciate it for those who can join us for the live show. Even if you got to put your headphones on at work and send us your ideas too, because we're all doing this together. Uh, Stephanie, of course, will have her tarot cards. And of course, it's always awesome to get Shanti and Mornay's opinion on the matter too. I also would like to hear if you've seen Annabelle. Did you ever go to the occult museum? And as always, I want to know your stories. Did you have a haunted dog growing up? Let me know all your thoughts, all your opinions, and all your conspiracies down in the comment section below.